Hi friends, <coughs> now in this session we will discuss the policy response by the government of India and as well as the Reserve Bank of India to manage this monetary system and as well as bring some sort of financial intermediation. In the last chapter we have discussed an opposite monetary management and financial intermediation how we have brought this opposite policies that means the more suitable policies how it has become possible. Now we will discuss some of the policies that was taken by the government and as well as Reserve Bank of India for managing this monetary and as well as the financial system perfectly. See in terms of monetary policy we have discussed how the policy rates whether it is repo, reverse repo. CRR, SLR, how we have managed and apart from that, apart from that because simply the monetary policy instruments cannot alone solve the problem because the crisis is a severe crisis and the, the amount of liquidity that you are injecting into the economy by way of repo is have its own constraints. So, you need to bring some other techniques also. So, those techniques are brought by the Reserve Bank of India to bring more and more liquidity into the economy so that demand and as well as the supply increased in the economy. Now, if you looking into the special refinance facility of 66,000 crore to all India financial institutions comprising NABAD, NHB, SIDB. That means a special finance refinancing facility has provided to this organization. You are all aware what is the meaning of refinance. Okay. So, they have provided to the provided to the banking institutes so that this much amount of money will be given in terms of loan at a concessional rates to the people in the economy so that they can use it for the kick starting of their businesses and any required operation and it will be either used as an investment or a working capital to the company that is how the supply side has started picking up. Next one, the term liquidity facility of 50,000 crore to ramp up COVID related healthcare infrastructure and services in the country. So, apart from the regular expenditure, extra 50,000 crore were provided to the institutes, those who are providing services in health sector so that uh, we can improve our health infrastructure. That is how we have injected extra 50,000 crore rupees. That means as a policy response, we have reduced the interest rate that will affect everyone. That will affect everyone who wanted to take the loan. But the point is, this is a specific amount of money only utilized for that particular purpose. Likewise, the 66,000 crore, how it was divided between NABAR and National Housing Bank and SIDB, you can see. And the SIDB share here it is very high 31,000. So, they are going to provide the loan to the small businesses in this country. Next, separate long term repo operations for small finance banks of 10,000 crore to support small business units and micro and small industries. See what is this special long term repo operation? See what is this long term repo operation? Long term repo operation. See under the normal repo operations, we will provide some amount of money that means actually what we say is bank normal commercial bank is taking a loan from the reserve bank of india that means reserve bank of india is providing some sort of money to the banking system at a concessional interest rate for the short term purpose that is what we need to understand now under this ltro the banking system is getting the money from the reserve bank of india at a concessional rate that means at the lower rate for a longer period of time which is from one year to three years. So, that means now they are taking the loan a long term loan at a smaller rate of interest and they can use it for other purposes and they can make a profit out of it and at the end of the second or third year they can repay it to it. So, that means under the LTRO operations also Reserve Bank of India has provided lot of finances to the banking system, banking system especially for the purpose of the small uh, industries for small finance banks they have provided 10,000 crore. It is a long term loan you no need to repay pay it that to at the existing repo that means a 4 percent of repo they got this 10,000 crore and that 4 percent interest will be for next 3 years they do not change according to the change in repo. 
so that is one important thing second one uh, another point is on top liquidity window of 15000 crore to the contact intensive sector contact intensive sector are the sectors which have faced lot of problem during this covid 19 because one of the mantra that we have preached to everyone is maintain physical distance and because of this physical distance it has become very difficult for the industries like restaurant hotel and some of the tourism thing so that is why in order to revive that because they have lost all their working capital now they need more amount of money to revive their businesses that is the reason why they have given on top liquidity window on top liquidity in the means separate liquidity window uh, it's a tenor up to three years again it is a long term loan something like a 15000 crore to the contact in intensive sector next one is extension of the antap targeted long term repo operation till 31st december 2021 so whatever see the the the, the they, have, they can take up to 31st December 2021 that means the time period extended so apart from your normal policy operations Reserve Bank of India has extended loans in terms of long term repo or special long term repo or on top liquidity window or to this SIDB and NHB or National All India Financial Banking Institutes or COVID infrastructure they pumped more amount of money they pumped more amount of money it's not simply saying like okay I have reduced the interest rate so you can take it from any institute no they have provided some special window of money to the different sectors so that the economy started reviving so that is one important policy intervention by the Reserve Bank of India in order to manage the monetary policy uh, so effectively <coughs> next one more important aspect that was discussed in the economic survey of the monetary management and the financial intermediation is with respect to this deposit insurance in India because recently we have seen the failure of different banking systems and once a banking system is failed the main concern to this country is what is the position of the depositors sometimes there are small depositors are there once they lost their deposit then who will compensate that money to them if it is a public sector bank government of india will do but if it is not a public sector bank who has to do so that is the reason why we thought like the deposit insurance must be improved we must improve the confidence on the banking system of india let the people deposit the money into that let the deposits will be distributed in terms of loan let the economic activity goes on and let the money multiplying factor increases so the foremost important thing is deposit insurance see insurance is very very important thing whether it is private or public sector bank if a bank fails who bothers and if i get my own money then why will i bother if a bank fails because the argument comes comes like okay the private sector banks they are failing or the public sector bank they are failing see the failing of bank is not depending whether they are in public sector or private sector it's all depending on their loan portfolio and their performance management practices and everything but as a consumer or as a depositor i don't bother about whether it is public or private as long as if i insured my deposits now with that in the year 2020 itself the, the finance minister announced and later they have they have increased that insurance to uh, from 1 lakh to 5 lakh they have insured from five, 1 lakh to 5 lakh but after that also it has necessitated some changes and uh, that was done last year with an amendment to that act i will come to that now but the deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation amendment act passed by the parliament 2021 so in the 2020 we have increased that insurance limit up to 5 lakh and we have amended the act again in 2021 to brought some changes to brought some changes now under this dicg act 1961 actually this deposit insurance and credit guarantee act was brought in the year 1961 1961 now what we will do is under this particular legislation under this particular legislation they will provide the insurance so the corporation is liable to pay the insurance deposits amount to the depositors of an insured bank suppose i myself insure i myself deposited something in the bank the bank will take the insurance on behalf of me for that deposits now suddenly when a bank fails then that 
insurance and credit guarantee corporation has to compensate that amount of money. And this credit guarantee corporation has to pay the money uh, to back to the banks when a liquidation happens that means sale of all assets closing down of the bank or a reconstruction or any other arrangement under a scheme or merger or acquisition happened by another bank in any of these cases in any of these cases if it is required definitely the insurer has to insure the deposit the insured bank okay the insurer has to insure the insured bank so that insurance amount and here when it comes to this insurance what are the different banks that comes under this insurance commercial banks payment banks small finance banks regional rural banks foreign banks foreign brand foreign bank branches in india and local area banks and cooperative banks in all the states and union territories so these are all comes under the net of this uh, deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation okay deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation next one more important aspect is one more important aspect is the deposit insurance coverage that began with 1500 in 1961 has been raised gradually to 1 lakh in 1993 and thereafter 5 lakh in 2020 so they have announced it in the budget 1 lakh to 5 lakh that means that means initially 1500 of your deposits are insured that means the government can give guarantee up to 1500 rupees if it is beyond 1500 rupees no one gives guarantee anyhow in the 1993 that was increased to 1 lakh but now recently it has increased to 5 lakh that means up to 5 lakh rupees of my deposits will be guaranteed by that insurance company suppose you have 4 lakh deposits i will get 4 lakh back but if i have 6 lakh up to 5 lakh only the insurer will insure beyond that there is no insurance but even if you insure up to 5 lakh rupees of deposits in a bank it will cover how much the total accounts in this country are 252.6 crores in that almost 247.8 crore accounts will be covered if you insure up to 5 lakh that means 98.1% of the account 98.1% of the accounts will get the benefit of that 5 lakh insurance that means 98.1% of the accounts in this country will hold the deposits less than 5 lakh rupees that's what i want but the global benchmark is only 80% but we are maintaining 98 if i want to take an amount wise amount wise the banking deposits in this country are 149.7 lakh crore 149 almost 150 lakh crore that is the total uh, deposits in the bank in that the deposits which are less than 5 lakh are half that means 76.2 lakh crore that means 50.9 percent of the amount that is there in the indian banking system is going to benefit the insurance facility of up to 5 lakh that means 50 percent the global benchmark is only 20 to 30 percent but we are maintaining 50.9 percent very very important next one and if you see bank group wise the percentage of insured deposits vis-a-vis -vis total deposits and if you looking into a bank wise out of their total deposits out of this total deposits how much percentage of the deposits are benefiting from this uh, revision of 1 to 5 lakh uh, deposit insurance take the case of rrb's regional rural banks almost 84 percent of the deposits are covered on that that means only remaining 16 percent of the deposits are above 5 lakh rupees take the case of cooperative 70 percent sbi 59 percent public sector banks 55 percent private sector banks 40 percent and 9% for the foreign banks. Anyway, foreign banks, normally people deposit huge amount of money. It's not possible for giving such a level of uh, insurance facility to them. But anyhow, if you take overall, 98.1% of the accounts are benefited and 50% of the deposits are going to benefit with this revision in insurance deposit from 1 lakh to 5 lakh. Next. Now, 
even after this insurance increase from 1 lakh to 5 lakh, still there are some problem and because of that we have brought an amendment to that DICGC Act. So, they have brought some provisions. So, what are the important provisions? What are the important provisions of this particular legislation? We will see. There are some important provisions. We can see introduce interim payments. Introduced interim payments. So, the interim payments will now be made by DICGC to depositors of those bank for whom any restriction or moratorium have been imposed by RBI. That means now the final settlement has not completed. That means you haven't declared yourself that you are completely insolvent. But still Reserve Bank of India has imposed some restrictions because your performance is not good. Immediately depositors will have lot of uh, no apprehensions in their mind. So the provision has been made, a provision has been made uh, to for the interim payment by the, car by the insurance company to the insured bank by the insurance company to the insured bank whenever RBI impose some restrictions under a banking regulation act because once you impose these restrictions under banking regulation act then it will be very difficult for the depositors to access to their savings then at that point of time the provision has made that definitely the insurer has to give some amount of money that we call it as interim payment. Next timeline for interim payments, that payment must be a time limit, you cannot take a long period because we have seen this Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank depositors have waited for around almost more than one or one and a half year to get their access to their own savings. But here if you see clear cut timeline of maximum 90 days they have provided and this respective bank has to provide the all information within 45 days to that insurance company or corporation and that corporation has to verify the details within next 30 days. Once the verification is completed immediately within the 15 days they have to disperse this amount of money. So such a strong uh, mechanism we have provided uh, for these uh, uh, depositors. depositors. Next one, repayment by bank to the DICGC, deferment of repayments. That means, suppose if a bank is unable to pay or if a bank is having some problem, so then DICGC may defer the repayment due to from an insured bank after an insurance payout on the term decided by the DICG board. If the DICG board decides, if the DICG, it's about repayment, it's not about payment, it's about repayment. That means, the DICG may defer the repayment due to it from an insured bank after insurance payout term decided by the DICG board. So, DICG board can decide at any point of time with respect to the defer deferment of the payment if something happened anything to that bank. Timely repayment by the bank to the DICGC, the bank has to pay whatever the premium and all within a stipulated time and no ceiling and premium. Earlier there was a ceiling and premium, now they have removed. Now they have removed. Now, since the act came into force, over 1500 crore has been paid to over 1.2 lakh depositors against their claims as of early January 2022. Around 1500 crore amount has been paid. Paid. That means, apart from increasing the insurance amount, we wanted to strengthen the insurance act to the the insurance act so that the confidence on so that the confidence on the banking system will enhance your banking system will function well your banking deposits will increase your banking uh, the sco functioning scope will increase your gross non performing assets come down the provisioning ratio increases so these are all interlinked these are all interlinked okay the capital base of bank increased so that is how they have brought an uh, economic survey has given a detailed analysis on this deposit insurance and the amendment to the deposit insurance credit, Gar credit guarantee corporation act recently have brought in 2021. So that is one important. Next, apart from this deposit insurance, they have also mentioned about this factoring in India. This was again a new thing that was mentioned in the economic survey. So, what is the meaning of factoring? What is the meaning of factoring? And they have mentioned here, factoring is an important source of liquidity worldwide, especially for MSMEs. Especially for MSMEs. What is the problem of liquidity to the MSMEs? Just assume MSME has produced some item. MSME has produced some item. 
and they have supplied it to a big company because it's a raw material or a spare part. Now the company may not give that entire amount of money immediately to the MSP, but they will give some certificate. They will give some certificate. That means, okay, you can encash this amount uh, within 90 days or within 100 days or within 120 days. So, if that is the case, what will this MSC, what this MSME will do with this certificate? They need money because they need to start the process it again because they are not a big business like you where they are having huge amount of capital and both investment capital and working capital. No, they need a regular working capital, otherwise they can't do. So, in order to, in order to uh, reduce this liquidity crunch to the MSMEs, earlier we have this bill system, discount, discounting of bills. Earlier we have a bill system, discounting of bills, but now we have started a new system called factoring. Now factoring is a transaction where an entity sells its receivable to the third party for its immediate fund. So this is a receivable, this is a receivable, it is a trade receivable, receivable from a company. Now what this MSME will do is, they will, what this MSME, what this MSME will do is, I will draw here. MSME company and again they have given a certificate. This is a receivable. Now what MSME will do is whatever the receivable that they have taken, they will sell this receivable to the third party, third party and they will take money from that third party in order to meet their own, in order to meet their own fund requirement. Later, later this third party will settle its transaction with the second party. First party MSME, second party is a company, they have supplied to them and they have given some trade receivable instead of cash, they do not have. Now you are selling it to the third party, third party will providing direct fund to the MSME, now MSME can use it. Now this third party will settle with the second party for that remaining amount. And anyway here they will offer some service charge, here they will lose some money because they need immediate amount of money. So this is what the factoring. So invoice can be sold to a factor for getting money immediately at a competitive interest rate. The factor then collects the payment from the buyer of the goods to earn a commission in the form of some interest. So here also they will earn some interest. Here they will get some good rate, good rate. Huh? This is what factoring. But what is the difference between bill discounting? Just now I have mentioned about bill discounting. In bill discounting, a bank or an NBFC give a certain percentage of the total outstanding value of invoices to the seller and in most cases the seller has to take on the responsibility. So the responsibility lies with whom? The seller. The responsibility is lies with whom? The seller. Now he must make sure that the settlement should happen. Here in our factoring, he no way cares about only these two people will settle. But in the bills, he must make sure that the settlement must happen between these two. They will take money from this, they will take money from third party, but the third party should get the money. That money's responsibility is not with the third party, but it is with these two parties. That is what the bill discounting. But here in this case, the factor takes on the responsibility for the collection of invoices. Okay? So this is factoring. Now, now we have brought some key changes as far as this factoring is concerned, as far as this factoring is concerned, just uh, read it uh, so that you can understand they are very important. Removal of principal business criteria has significantly increased the number of eligible NBFC. That means they have relaxed some rules and regulations so that many people are getting the benefit of this. The time period for registration of invoices. Uh, or I think they have the time period for registration of invoices and satisfaction of the charge upon it may be specified by the government by rules to streamline the process. They wanted to streamline the process process and you are all aware about this trades platform. Trades platform at present the factoring done either manually or a trade receivable discounting system. Now the amended act and new rules and regulations allow the concern trade platform to register change directly with the central registry okay they are creating a central registry with that central registry they are going to bring some changes and here just i want to give an information to do this business we have brought an act called the factoring regulation act factoring regulation act factoring regulation act 
in 2011 that was amended in 2021 in that amendment act they have brought these changes okay factoring regulation act okay the definition of assignments factoring business they have okay taken oh just try to read it just try to read it the amendments have liberalized the restrictive provisions in the act and at the same time ensure that strong regulatory oversight mechanism is placed under rba because it is with respect to the settlements overall this change would lead to the widening of factoring ecosystem ecosystem in the country and helps msme significantly by providing added avenue for the availing credit facility so just have an idea about the concept of factoring how it is different from bills and what is this factoring regulation act what was the recent amendment and what they have brought in this what is a trust platform and how it is going to helpful to the msme and how it will cater the needs of the msme uh, credits okay just have an idea on this the factoring have an idea on this factoring now in our country four types of entities are allowed to do the factoring that means who is this third entity just now i have uh, i have drawn uh, this who is this third entity who is this third entity third entity can be a bank this third entity can be just i'll write here third entity can be the third entity can be a bank that means the third party entity can be a bank it can be a statutory corporation it can be a statutory corporation that means a corporation started through a statute of the government bank or a statutory corporation or it can be an nbfc or it can be a company anyone can do in this factoring business but the only thing is they must take the approval from the rbi rbi registration is compulsory in order to do the factoring business or the discounting of bills okay next <coughs> yeah once this factoring is completed once this factoring is completed and again one more thing just i want to uh, mention this on msmes on msmes the reserve bank of india has appointed a committee reserve bank of india has appointed a committee the committee we call it as uk sinha committee uk sinha committee this uk sinha has recommended for this and based on the recommendations of uk sinha committee uh, for providing long term financial sustainability to the msme sector they have brought this amendment in the year 2021 to the 2011 act just remember uk sinha 2011 act 2021 amendment definition of factor and what are the factors and trade system and everything next apart from this apart from this the survey has also mentioned the survey has also mentioned about the national asset reconstruction company limited and indian debt resolution company limited these two entities that i have already discussed in the our class itself what is NA, what is this narcl and what is this idrcl what are their individual roles they are going to function they are going to have their own relationship that relationship will be defined through a debt management agreement a debt management agreement and this national asset reconstruction company limited will aggregate and also will acquire the whatever the non-performing assets and the, this idrcl is going to resolve that and they are going to run through a proper agreement they will work and on one the government is having more majority on other the private people are going to have the majority recently they have started their process recently they have started their process it was already discussed but once again it was mentioned in the survey just read it very important second one is yeah when it comes to this ibc insolvency and bankruptcy code i have discussed earlier but re recently the government has come up with recently the government has come up with a pre-packaged insolvency resolution process for corporate msmes that means if if the if the insolvency and resolution process is lengthy all the msmes may not uh, afford to use this technique for their resolution that is why what we thought is why can't we have a why can't we have a special prepackaged 
insolvency process under the IBC. Under the IBC, that means you no need to follow such a lengthy process, such a lengthy process, so that you can solve the disputes uh, at a lesser amount of time. That is what the idea. See, it is an informal up to a point and formal thereafter. That means till such a point, it is an informal. Instead of going through highly formal route, you can uh, you can talk and you can discuss, you can put various arguments and you can try to resolve. But it is only up to a informal. But after that, anyway, it is informal. It blends debtor in possession with the creditor in control. It is neither a fully private nor a fully public process. But they have somehow they have brought a new policy. With that policy, they are going to bring some sort part of easy resolution process for the msmes it was uh, mentioned and uh, uh, let msmes use of these techniques so that they can resolve their own debt problem so that both industry and as well as the banking system also runs well okay next another important aspect that was another important aspect that was mentioned another important aspect that was mentioned is this cross border insolvency see if you looking into insolvency and bankruptcy code, we have seen the progress and all. But this insolvency and bankruptcy code will only be applicable to the Indian companies and if the debtors are in India. But if it is a cross border insolvency, how we will do? For that, first we need to understand what exactly the cross border insolvency. <coughs> cross border insolvency means if a debtor if a debtor is an ins suppose if, if the debtor become insolvent then only the insolvency process comes if the insolved debtor asset if the insolved debtor asset because you have to liquidate that asset no if that asset is present in more than one country or otherwise or otherwise any of the creditor any of the creditor is a foreign then definitely this cross border insolvency comes into the picture because the thing is your own the, the rules and regulations statute everything you are following domestic but the assets and the people are belong to foreign country so the existing provision the existing provisions of insolvency and bankruptcy code <coughs> is not allowed for is not allowed for this cross border insolvency so ibc has at present no standard instrument to restructure the firm insolving the cross border jurisdiction there is no provision and mechanism in ibc except section 234 and 235 but section 234 and 235 of ibc but what exactly this section 234 and section 235 ibc says they says like this act that means ibc act is empowering the central government it is empowering the central government to enter into a bilateral agreement with the other countries to resolve the situation about the cross-border insolvency. That means simply this act is empowering the government to sign a bilateral agreement. That means with which country you are having a dispute. That means whether the asset or the credit are in which country. With that country you make a bilateral agreement and try to resolve. But can you go on making the bilateral agreement? Is it really possible, feasible? We can do immediately. There are many things involved in this the foreign relations everything comes into the picture so it's not possible but in total what i want to say is the existing provisions of the ibc have no standard framework framework to deal with the cross border insolvency cross border insolvency now there are various issues that are associated with the cross border insolvency even if i want to go for a cross border insolvency there are various issues that are associated. What are the different type of issues that are associated? See, first one is to what extent, to what extent an insolvency administration will be access to the assets held in foreign country. See, you are a judge, you are giving the judgment in India. But the administrator of this whatever the insolvency process you are doing, are you able to access to the assets that are there in foreign country because you need to liquidate it? Are you have an access? This is a big question. Access is a big question. Second one is the priority payment. Priority payment. Priority payment. 
priority payment in the sense to whom you have to give the money first to whom you have to settle the money first is it to the foreign creditor or to the indian creditor because you don't get full amount of money through the liquidation process just now you have seen in the statistic how much you are able to recover 7% 7% in liquidation anyhow 32% we got in through the resolution but 7% in liquidation so priority of payment to whom you have to give the priority next one is third one is the recognition of the claims of a local creditor in a foreign administration suppose if the creditor is indian but the resolution is happening in foreign country did the foreign administration is going to accept the local claims so local claims are going to accept at the foreign administration level again this is a question next one is recognition and enforcement recognition and enforcement of local security and taxation system over local assets where a foreign administration is appointed the asset is in india the asset is in india for this the indian taxation system indian laws everything applied but the person who is adjudicating on this indian assets is a foreigner is a foreigner is a foreigner so these are all some of the problems associated with the cross border insolvency because this is in the era of globalization and when our industries are taking lot of uh, money or lot of capital from the foreign countries so definitely this cross border insolvency is also an important aspect important aspect but one thing that was already suggested there was a commission appointed there was a commission appointed uh, in the year 2018 we call it as insolvency law committee insolvency law committee appointed in the year 2018 what they have suggested is what they have suggested is there is already a standardized framework for cross border insolvency is there that is the united nation commission on united nation commission on international trade law international trade law you can call it as un ctral united nation commission on international trade law which was started in the year 1997 there was an agreement under this they have clearly provided the cross border insolvency law with some modification to suit our own indian needs we can start this process already around 49 countries have started this singapore uk south korea like many other countries and based on this framework they have started this uh, arbitration and even resolution techniques they have started so why can't you adapt to that why can't you adapt to that so that is one thing where we need to bring some changes to the ibc so the changes to the ibc especially with respect to the uh, cross border insolvency is very very important aspect very very important aspect so these are some of the aspects that are mentioned in the budget sorry mentioned in the economic survey so just have an idea because you may get a questions on this ibc because the behavioral change of the ibc behavioral change that happened because of ibc and the working status of ibc and also the cross border insolvency of the ibc and also with respect to this deposit uh, insurance and the, the recent changes associated with that and also reserve bank of india's decisions in order to inject more liquidity into the economy that were discussed in the economic survey just have a clear idea very very important use it for mains and as well as the prelims okay so this is something about opposite monetary management and financial development the policy response to that by the government of india and as well as reserve bank of india okay thank you amrita ias academy